right. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. Um, my name is Jan Koscielniak. This is my colleague, Eric Marvitz. We are both engineers at our labs. And today we'll be talking to you about our adventures in API development. Let's get started with today's topics. Um, we'll talk about one main thing, and this is how to maintain and build an uh, API that supports both REST and GraphQL interfaces. I will first be talking about Pixis, which is the API in question. Then Eric will take over and walk us through how we approach solving that problem. And lastly, I'll talk about some of the experience we have, we've had and some of the lessons that we learned along the way. Um, there's not a lot of you in the room, but uh, I'll ask anyway, how many of you have some kind of REST or GraphQL knowledge, just like the basics? Okay, that's majority of the hands up. So I'll just let you look at this for a little bit without commentary. And I will go to the next slide. And that is about Pixis itself. So if you Google Pixis, these are the likely things to come up. Uh, J-pop band, small constellation, and a Greek pottery vessel. Pixis is none of those things. However, it's named, it's based on the uh, Greek pottery vessel on the right. The Pixis we are here to talk about is a container metadata API with, as I said, REST and GraphQL interfaces. Chances are that if you ever pulled an uh, image from a Red Hat registry, uh, you interacted in with Pixis by verifying its signatures. You could have also interacted with Pixis uh, by going to the Red Hat container catalog for which there's a URL and a QR code. Uh, to continue, uh, Pixis provides business logic uh, authentication, authorization, all that stuff for a fleet of microservices that make up the Red Hat uh, container release pipeline. Um, its data are stored in MongoDB and uh, it is written in Python, currently serving over a couple of millions of requests per day. So in order to provide context for the problems that we had to solve, we have to look at what the requirements were at the beginning. Uh, Pixis was originally set to replace Lightblue, which is a CRUD API written in Java. Uh, it was no longer sufficient at the time. Pixis was required to provide a CRUD API, uh, and on top of that, uh, ability to implement complex business logic that might differ for internal and external customers. When I say an external customer, it might be uh, a Red Hat partner or uh, somebody who's accessing the Red Hat container catalog. Uh, by an internal customer, I mean somebody who is running behind a Red Hat VPN, perhaps a part of the release pipeline. So uh, Pixis used to be a small Flask application with several main, manually maintained schemas. If you wanted to add a new endpoint, you have to modify all of those in order to do that. So that would be modifying an open API spec, adding a Python callback, and then uh, writing a Marshmallow schema. For those of you unfamiliar with Marshmallow, it's a Python library for serialization and deserialization of data. And finally, uh, you got to ensure that the data is stored in the database uh, in the correct representation. representation sorry. Uh, you can probably tell that while this might be sustainable uh, for smaller APIs or APIs that do not change much over time, uh, this was not the case for Pixis, as it is unfortunately neither of those. Uh, the number of endpoints grew. Uh, it is currently at 100 externally, uh, over 150 internally. The logic for validating data and whatnot, uh, the business logic got more complex. 
and as I said, it often significantly differed for internal and external customers. Uh, additionally, we were requested to introduce GraphQL uh, interface as REST was no longer sufficient for our internal cost customers. We now knew that we had to change our approach. In order to evolve, we set a couple of goals that uh, we wanted to achieve. First and foremost, the duplicate. Uh, as a developer, I don't want to make the same change to multiple uh, schemas when adding a new field to the API. I also don't want to spend too much time bootstrapping a new endpoint because it like, likely works similar to many other endpoints. And I don't want to maintain uh, REST and GraphQL specifications manually because that can create inconsistencies. As a developer, I'm very lazy and want to do as little repetitive work uh, as possible. So I want the boring stuff automated. And lastly, as a developer, I want the new thing to be modular because I want to be able to react to customer demands or combat tech debt without breaking the entire application. To reach those goals, we bet on a schema first approach. Eric will now walk us through what that means in the context of fixes. Take it away. All right. Uh, we started with the assumption that we are uh, always in our schemas describing different aspects of the same data. Um, take it this example of the creation date field. You can see the REST, GraphQL, and Marshmallow uh, representation for it. Uh, each describes the data a little bit differently with different attributes, but important part is that no schema is entirely complete. Uh, also, it was said that our API was grew in size those schemas were also growing. It was hard to preserve parity between them uh, and was hard to contribute to our API without, uh, without a mistake. Uh, so we realized that we need a better fi uh, find a better way how to tackle this. And this is our solution. Uh, it's called central schema. The idea is quite simple. Uh, we capture all the information into one specification, into one single source of truth. Uh, on the right side, you can see this example. Uh, you can see the representation of our daytime field in a central schema uh, containing basically enough information to generate all the schemas that we saw in the previous slide. So what is the, what is the central schema actually? Uh, it is pretty straightforward. Uh, the central schema describes types, which are, which are actually our data types uh, representing data in our, pouring in our API. Uh, there are also endpoints, queries, and mutations that uh, re are referencing those data types as an input or as a response. But how does the central schema become any of mentioned schemas? Uh, so let's focus on the GraphQL schema generation. We are looking on the beginning. Central schema specification divided into the four main files. You can see the data type itself that is gathering like all necessary information about fields and their attributes. There are also queries and mutations. Uh, those queries and mut mutations are describing the behavior of these uh, entry points. You can see the uh, arguments, you can see the authorization and the response that is actually referencing those data types. Data type. Uh, and for the completeness, there is also endpoints file and this endpoint, files, uh, endpoint file is actually used to generate our open API schema. All right, uh, to produce GraphQL schema, you need a GraphQL generator in our architecture. What is a GraphQL generator? It's a kind of simple Python module that is, it works in several steps. First, it validates the central schema, then it transforms to the uh, GraphQL definitions, and at the end, uh, this GraphQL generation, generator will attach uh, directives. Uh, finally, the generator will uh, dump the final uh, GraphQL schema to the file. Uh, this is the minimal example uh, showing the final GraphQL schema. You might need notice an important detail there, which is not was was not present in the previous slides. You can see the two uh, entry points, query and the mutation, and there is a bunch of directives attached to them. Uh, I would like to stop here and 
uh, I would like to stress out why imp directives are so important for us. Well, directives are smallest atomic functional units in our application. What does it mean? It means that we are using them for wrapping arbitrary functionality of our API. For example, uh, authorization, validation of the data, uh, encryption, database operation, uh, operations, everything. Uh, and it is also important to note that we are executing those directives uh, in order and those ordered groups of the directives are specifying our API behavior, our, our API contract. Okay, uh, so this is the schema that is ready to be passed to our GraphQL application, uh, which will expose GraphQL API. Okay, at this point you may say, uh, wait, 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 <laughs> this is just a writing GraphQL schema with extra steps, right? Uh, but let's not forget that there, there, there is like multiple, multiple generators producing multiple schemas, all sourcing from the same central schema specification. Uh, in fact, the central schema started as an effort to unify GraphQL, REST, and Marshmallow schemas, but we quickly, quickly realize uh, and identify the potential that like possibilities are endless. We can wrap basically anything there. Uh, so over time, we expanded the schema to include uh, GraphQL federation information, what, which serves to incorporate fixes into larger structures with other services also exposing GraphQL APIs. Uh, we have also some uh, supporting schemas uh, from the perspective of database. We have a schema for administration of uh, indices in our underlying Mongo database. We have a schema that is supporting mechanism that is uh, translating or mapping requested fields from the GraphQL query directly to the database, creating projection to save the bandwidth and the memory. Uh, we have also a schema that is uh, supporting our extensive filtering mechanism. Uh, this filtering mechanism is used in a get many queries for uh, filtering out results that are wanted or unwanted. And we have also other usages. Uh, we are using the central schema for generate, uh, generating uh, integration uh, testing data because when you have like all the schema with all attributes, uh, it is easy to reflect it, that uh, into integration testing. It, it's a pity to not use it, actually. And last but not least, we are generating uh, our beautiful documentation from the central schema. Uh, I will, again, stop here. Uh, you can sc scan the QR code. This documentation is actually deployed as standalone application. This is the public version of it. So feel free to check it out by scanning the QR code. Uh, and I will say some words about it. Uh, so initially, our API documentation was just a sw Swagger, uh, which is like provided open API solution, and we had also like a bunch of uh, readme files. Uh, eventually, we find out that our users have, are finding out very useful the bunch of information that, are, that is contained in our central schema because we have uh, many descriptions there for queries, mutations, endpoints, fields, that are actually describing complex business logic, uh, describing difficult workflows behind them. So it was like, again, pity to not expose this information, to have it bury, buried in our repository. So we decided to uh, generate those data. Uh, we basically uh, parse it with the Sphinx framework and deploy it as a standalone service. Uh, and also, as for the developer documentation, we are also constantly producing a bunch of readme files, and those readme files are parsed and included into an uh, internal version of this documentation. Okay, let's get back to the, to the central schema. This is probably the most uh, interesting part, uh, because one of the biggest advantages of the central schema is that brings an opportunity for no-code contribution into our API. Uh, we can consider three levels of the API contribution. The, so this is the first level. Uh, imagine you, that you need to like uh, some endpoint query mutation or data type. Well, uh, it can be done rapidly by uh, adding a few lines to our central schema uh, representation. The central schema basically abstracts any uh, API complexity, any mm, necessary knowledge about the generator, 
you just write a few YAML of your few YAML lines and APL just will work. And this is the approach which is very suitable and fitting for the new contributors, like the extra external contributors or the onboarding for onboarding uh, new team members. Okay, uh, no code. Of course, bare YAML is not always sufficient, right? Often you need like more advanced validation logic or generally business logic behind your endpoints. Uh, so central schema can be simply extended by additional validation functions attached to the queries or mutations. Uh, at this point, of course, slightly advanced knowledge of the central schema is needed because contributors must, must know, must be aware of uh, presence of this mechanism and how to this mechanism use. But it's not a rocket science. It is easily extensible. It is it's just a small step from the previous step. And last level of contribution is the extension or uh, modification of the central schema itself. Uh, it is done by advanced developers implementing new features or modify existing ones. Uh, it is with, with, with the intention to simplify uh, life of API contributors or future self uh, or bring the new features to the users. This is the place where we expanding the central schema with the GraphQL Federation, when we are adding functionality for administration of the indices in our Mongo database, uh, this, is, this, is, this is the way. Uh, of course, this is the most difficult task because uh, it requires like advanced knowledge of the central schema generator and underlying API itself. All right, uh, let's su summarize this section. Uh, implementing of Central schema took a lot of work, but it was a long-term investment. And we learned that it, this kind of investment pays off in the, especially in the in dynamic environment, when you have a full, when, when you have uh, like many new requests to your API, when you need to do a lot of changes on the fly. Uh, so I would like to highlight four uh, points that we learned uh, that are working for us. So, uh, Simplified contribution. Basically, anyone can be our API developer after a quick introduction into our uh, central schema specification. Uh, the central schema also made our APR more modular, more extensible, what improved overall maintainability and readiness for new changes. It is perfect fit for uh, keeping or preserving parity between like uh, multiple API technologies, like when we have to support uh, GraphQL or REST with all underlying layers, validation, and others. And last but not least, uh, central schema is, thanks to its uh, schema-driven approach, very transparent for onboarding it from the, perspective of, from the perspective of developers, it is easily to onboard, and from the perspective of users, it is easy to use. Uh, so that's it from my side. Uh, I would like to pass the word uh, to Jan and he will talk about like the comparing REST and GraphQL and what to use, what not to use, or both. Okay, the first thing that I wanna share from the lessons learned section is our experience uh, during the years of maintaining both REST and GraphQL interfaces. Let's look at REST first. In our view, is the ultra reliable. Every, almost everybody knows it. There's almost no learning curve. If you're an API developer, or sorry, if you're developing an app that talks to an API and your use case is simple enough, you're probably going to go for REST because it's easy to implement. Uh, I'd say a big plus is the error reporting via HTTP status code because it, it's easy to handle responses. It's easy to early identify errors. Uh, it's also weakly typed, which can be a benefit. It can be a negative, uh, but it makes it flexible. Uh, as in, if you want to change the data type of a field, it's easy as that. It's less ideal aspect is that it can't reference other objects 
uh, in other ways than uh, underscore links, which is essentially just a pointer to another endpoint. GraphQL, on the other hand, is uh, much harder to uh, learn if you are coming from a REST background. For a lot of our users, uh, we had to uh, do some education in this, uh, both on the GraphQL uh, mechanisms and on the specifics of our own implementation. One big difference that uh, clients coming from a REST background uh, struggle with is the error reporting, because in GraphQL, it's contained in the response, not in the HTTP status code, that's almost always 200. So it can be tricky for them to implement proper error handling, as uh, I don't think that uh, many client libraries uh, do it in some kind of standardized way. It is strongly typed, which is a double-edged sword. Uh, on one hand, you can check a lot of the things in the schema. You don't have to do a lot of the work. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, changing the schema uh, is very hard. Uh, so much so that the GraphQL specification uh, recommends that you, instead of changing the field, you introduce a new one. But this can be hard when you have 20 clients that all need to make the change to the new field. Uh, it creates a lot of uh, tall work. The strongest feature of GraphQL, I would say, is that it provides an easy way to fetch object, objects that are related to the object you're querying for. You just make a query, and the server does all the work for you, including connecting, uh, making the association uh, between to the two related objects. Um, you, don't, you don't have to do basically any, anything else than write the query. For uh, last thing I want to mention is federation, which basically squashes or merges multiple graphical schemas into one big schema. And that way, users can fetch data from multiple sources and never know about it. Um, imagine doing that with REST. So what to make of all this, REST or GraphQL? Um, our view is that you don't have to choose. You can do both uh, because they all fit a different need for different clients. So you could say, uh, you know, that'd be great, uh, but that must be hard to do, hard to maintain, hard to build. Eric already touched uh, on how central schema helps us keep parity between the schemas, how it makes it easy to generate uh, those schemas. I will now talk a little bit about how we build REST uh, as a layer on top of GraphQL. Our REST application is basically a very thin client that when receiving an HTTP request, a REST request, will translate that to GraphQL query, forward that to the GraphQL application, and then when it gets the response back from GraphQL, it will reformat and uh, respond with a classic REST response. Uh, that's what this very uh, complicated diagram shows. It's uh, just that easy. Um, I also want to mention how we migrated to this approach, because I think it's worth mentioning. We built, first built the base GraphQL app, um, which is, as Eric uh, presented, just a bunch of GraphQL directives that, when connected together, make up a GraphQL API that can actually do stuff. Uh, then, for a given database collection, we implemented that in central schema to have queries and annotations that corresponded to the REST endpoints and that we already had uh, as definitions in the central schema. Uh, so we had to extend those. Uh, once that was done, uh, we extensively tested those with integration testing, as in querying the API, checking the responses, uh, 
checking the business logic that uh, is included in those endpoints uh, or queries and mutations respectively. And uh, here I want to again mention what Eric said that we use uh, central schema driven this data generation, which helped us uh, test more robustly. And we also heavily invested in making the tests easy to contribute to um, because developers are famously known for not wanting to write tests for features. So we took the approach of trying to make that easy so it's not such a pain in the ass. And I think that uh, paid off because uh, the migration went quite smoothly. Uh, the final step is to just flip a switch in the central schema, flip a field, and the application will automatically pull in the information contained in the OK API spec and will start forwarding those queries to the GraphQL application. So that was it for the lessons learned. We're nearing the end of our talk. Before we say goodbye, I'd like to reiterate a couple of points, a couple of lessons um, that we think are important that you should take away from this talk. And those are first the most recently heard one. Uh, no API interface is perfect for every client. So don't choose, do both REST and GraphQL. Um, next important point I would highlight is uh, listen to your customers, because for us, introducing a GraphQL API or federating with other schemas was a customer-driven request, and it was an investment that paid off, that made our application better. And last but not least, we believe in investing in the developer experience, uh, aka making, making contributing easy and hassle-free, and we believe that it produces uh, both uh, happy developers and uh, happy customers. And with that, I uh, would like to thank you for listening to us. Uh, we hope you found something valuable in our talk. And now is the time for your questions, if you have any. Uh, I will just know that we're around for the whole conference. So if you want to approach us, uh, if you think this is something you could use, we're looking for use cases to possibly open source this. So. Uh, let us know. Uh, any questions? All right. Um, first of all, as a Pixis user and uh, of your uh, REST uh, interface, you hide the GraphQL um, complexity very well. So thank you. Um, uh, it's a great, <laughs> really great uh, API to use. Um, but my question was primarily around because I only understand it from a REST uh, from the REST uh, endpoint side. Um, what drove the, what, was it the federation need that drove the decision to go to GraphQL? Like what, what were the like high level use cases that really drove that decision? Well, um, I would say that, uh, the main reason we decided to go GraphQL first was that the REST API is just more simple. It's basically if you did GraphQL query and requested all the fields. Uh, that's basically what a REST call is, right? Uh, so in order to not get like drowned in uh, like two different applications, we said, okay, we'll, we'll just abstract away uh, the graphical complexity. We'll just write an uh, adapter, which is like, I don't know, three Python files, couple of functions. It's not that complicated. Uh, then we'll just do that work for us. It will translate the queries uh, that the GraphQL app uh, can understand, and then just forward forward the response back to the REST application. So I think to summarize, the reason was just uh, to reduce the amount of code we had to maintain. Thank you for that question. Anybody else? If not, then thank you for listening. Thank you very much.